The ancient crowds of the Roman arena always hungered for new forms of entertainment. This desire could only be sated by the hosting of ever more massive games involving hundreds of fighters and elaborately staged productions. It's in this entertainment arms race that such novelties as the famed Namakia were developed. Today though, let us focus on another one of these exotic displays, the female gladiators of the arena. I absolutely love learning about daily life in the past, but there is no better way to feel connected to history than to trace back the story of your own ancestors. As the child of immigrants to a new country, I've always been intrigued to learn more about my roots in France. Thankfully our sponsor MyHeritage made the process easier than ever. In just a few clicks, I was able to start building a family tree and learn more about my distant relatives than I've ever been able to put together from my aunts, uncles, and grandparents' stories. For example, MyHeritage puts over 18 billion records at your fingertips, and I was quickly able to find ancestors on census rules from the 18th century, on military death records from the First World War, and on prisoner lists from the Second World War. I was genuinely hooked to not only learn more about my family, but also to learn more about the world in which they lived. To this end, MyHeritage actually has awesome tools for repairing, animating, colorizing, and enhancing old family photos which blew me away. Right now, you can begin to explore your own family history by clicking the link in the description to sign up for a 14-day free trial and enjoy all the amazing features MyHeritage has to offer. If you decide to continue your subscription, you'll actually get a 50% discount. Enjoy! Records of gladiator combat permeate the majority of Roman history, even going as far back as the Etruscans. As the centuries wore on, and as the politicians of the Roman Republic looked to distinguish themselves more and more, the great games and festivals, known as Munera, became increasingly elaborate. After all, there was no better way to make a name for yourself than through this most exciting of advertising platforms. And so it was that the most ambitious men of their age sought power through the bread and circuses of the games. In these matters, there were two major factors to making a series of great, distinct games. An editor could either go big or go unique. Size could be the number of gladiators, parades, or condemned criminals, with bragging statements on the numbers of these appearing in both pre- and post-game inscriptions. Uniqueness, on the other hand, was by far the more alluring trait. This could be achieved by bringing animals in from beyond Rome's borders, as well as through unique displays such as dressing your gladiators in pure silver or by using distinctive acts. Today, we're covering perhaps one of the most evocative of these acts, the gladiatrix. The word gladiatrix is not attested in ancient literature and is in fact a modern distinction. Latin inscriptions and references describe, quote, women fighting in the arena or, quote, women wielding swords. But for our purposes, it's much more convenient to use the word gladiatrix in a similar fashion to the way we might refer to the Eastern Roman Empire simply as the Byzantines. Sourcing on gladiatrices is generally pretty rare since the vast majority of gladiators were men trained in all-male schools. The idea of women fighting was scandalous to the Romans, and so, predictably, this meant that gladiatrices were incredibly popular in their events, even if those events were probably pretty rare. Emperors looking to make their games distinct would advertise massive games at which female gladiators were prominent. More minor officials would also advertise gladiatrices as the memorable event at their games, memorialized in inscriptions such as this hyperbolic claim that states, quote, Hostilianus was the first of everyone since the founding of the city to hold games with gladiators, as well as giving women the sword. Needless to say, that inscription, which dates to the late 2nd century AD, is blatantly hyperbolic. Not only is the man in question not the first to hold games with gladiators and swordswomen, but he's also not the first person to allow women into the arena to fight. That distinction actually goes back to the murky and confusing days of the early imperial era, the Age of Augustus. Augustus is actually well known as a relatively prudish emperor, putting laws in place in an attempt to return Rome to the good old days. This included a number of incentives for the traditional family, the number of children every family should have, and the role of women in society. It's here that we actually have one of our more fascinating surviving pieces of imperial legislation. The inscription etched in bronze declares the following, quote, No one should bring to the arena a senator's son, daughter, 
grandson, granddaughter, great-grandson, great-granddaughter, or any male whose father or grandfather, whether paternal or maternal, or brother, or any female whose husband or father or grandfather, whether paternal or maternal, or brother, had ever possessed the right of sitting in the seats reserved for the equestrians, or induce them by means of a fee to appear, or to snatch the plumes of gladiators, or take the training sword from anyone, or to take part in any way, in any similar subordinate capacity. While this ban applied just as much to theater as it did to the arena, it's telling in its specificity, namely in targeting of the youth. Here we see how the Roman old guard was deeply upset by the young men and women who participated in acts that they found shameful. This situation was absolutely unacceptable. To the Romans, being a performer in any capacity was actually thought to bring on a concept called infamia. Strictly speaking, it was the loss of legal or social standing but like any Roman concept, it's a bit difficult to put that word into English. Mere dishonor doesn't do it justice. Infamia was more like a black spot on one's very soul that could easily spread throughout the entire family. After all, if someone of that bloodline could be brought so low, then anyone else surely could as well. Gladiators and gladiatrices were in the same category as anyone else who sold their bodies for money, such as actors and even prostitutes. For a woman to take up a sword on top of that might well be entertaining for all viewers, but that was rooted in the fact that that entertainment was pure shock value for the Romans who looked on. Augustus's law gives us a clue that the first signs of gladiatrices were probably in the early empire and was probably an extension of women appearing increasingly on stage at the theater. After all, male gladiators were basically just actors using live weapons, so why would it be the case that women were not doing the same? If they did take up arms, then they were probably trained in private traveling schools in a similar fashion to actors. These would have been able to offer their services at a premium far and wide. While we have written records of repeated appearances in the city of Rome, the only surviving engraving that clearly depicts two female gladiators is in Helicarnassus, a city in southwestern Anatolia. These two gladiatrices were named Amazon and Achillea for this contest, probably in a recreation of the famed combat between Achilles and the Queen of the Amazons. While Achilles prevailed in the Homeric version, this gender-bent live-action scene apparently ended in a draw. Perhaps what's most interesting is that women in the scene are dressed exactly the same way as their male counterparts. They were bare-chested, dressed in heavy but revealing gear, and one of them even holds her sword in her left hand, a popular stance for gladiators to throw their opponent off guard. Gladiatrices probably fought with the same rules as the gladiators themselves. They were heavily trained to maintain their discipline and concentration. After all, theirs was a blood sport, and they were not necessarily expected to fight to the death. Gladiatorial combats were a show for entertainment, more than anything else, and the gladiatrices were no exception. They would fight and bleed in a showy manner, but there was always a referee to break them up if one seemed to be losing her head. In preparation for these fights, they would certainly exercise hard, though it's difficult to tell whether their regimen was the same as the male gladiators in the more permanent schools. Nonetheless, they probably maintained a similar diet of fava bean porridge and charcoal water. Professional doctors too were maintained by all gladiator troops, and gladiatrices would probably have merited top-of-the-line doctors as well. After all, they were considered to be an exotic, rare commodity. That rarity would have merited higher prices, and thus those prices would have encouraged their owner to keep them at peak performance. Some of the first major records of women fighting in the arena was done about the reign of Nero. While some of these accounts are certainly exaggerated, we do know that he was infamous for loving gladiatorial displays to an unhealthy degree. The first of these displays was apparently held during the games in memory of his mother, when Nero apparently held a full retelling of Roman history on the sands with the families of the famous. Here's how one of our sources puts it. Quote, in honor of his mother, he celebrated a most magnificent and costly festival the events taking place for several days in five or six theaters at once. It was on this occasion that an elephant was led to the highest gallery of the theater and walked down from that point on ropes carrying a rider. There was also another exhibition that was at once most disgraceful and most shocking when men and women not only of the equestrian but even of the senatorial order appeared as performers in the orchestra, in the circus, and in the hunting theater like those who are held in lowest esteem. Some of them played the flute, and danced in pantomimes, or acted in tragedies and comedies, or sang to the lyre. They drove horses, killed wild beasts, and fought as gladiators, some willingly, and some very much against their will. In telling these stories, Cassius Dio was doing his best to paint Nero in the worst light possible, 
but this kind of display does seem plausible for a man who happily indulged himself in his pursuits of the arts. His further descriptions, such as the implication that male and female gladiators were paired off to have sex in the arena, are a bit more suspect, but even then, aren't entirely unbelievable. As I mentioned earlier, gladiators were seen as performers in every aspect, selling their bodies for the pleasure of the crowd. A scenario straight out of a porn movie wouldn't be too terrifically out of place, albeit distasteful for the Roman aristocracy. But Nero didn't stop there. It seems that gladiatrices enjoyed a relatively regular amount of time on the sands. One future incident, which Cassius Dio refers to as a disgrace, involved a visit from the Parthian king and his family. Nero lavished them with unimaginable wealth at every instant of their journey, allotting them 800,000 sesterces per day for the nine months of their journey. Nero met the foreign king at Neapolis, the moment that he landed in Italy, and they both traveled from there to Rome. Quote, Nero threw him a gladiatorial exhibition at Puteoli. It was under the direction of Petrobius, one of his freedmen, who managed to make it a most brilliant and costly affair, as may be seen from the fact that on one of the days, Ethiopians, men, women, and children were the only ones who appeared in the arena. It's unclear exactly what story was attempting to be told here, but perhaps it may have been the story of Andromeda, but at the same time we know that Ethiopians in general were significantly less likely to have been enslaved by the Romans, who had never conquered the region. It's far more likely that these performers were recruited specifically for this exhibition, likely making it far more expensive in many ways, but also highlighting Nero's love of seeing women in performing roles. Interestingly, one of Rome's poets, of the Twitter troll variety, makes several allusions to gladiatrices in the first century AD. Oftentimes, he includes these allusions in his caustic mockery of Rome's supposedly effeminate culture, where men were apparently just as likely to sleep with men as they were to sleep with women. He notes one particular woman, who may or may not be real, named Mevia, who was famous for her bare-chested performances during the arena beast hunts. Even he notes, though, that there aren't many women wrestlers, or women on an athlete's diet. Looking through our records, it appears that ancient historians mostly seem to ignore when these spectacles took place, unless they could be used as a sign that the emperor in question was a negative influence on society. Domitian, for instance, was known for not only allowing women to participate in foot races along men, but also was especially fond of gladiatrices and held regular matches with them, pitting them against each other in stage combat. Cassius Dio and Suetonius both note this with disgust, as well as emphatically highlighting that some of these games were even held at night by torchlight. While there's no explicit record of it, there's also a distinct possibility that some of these gladiatrices may have participated in Domitian's Namakia. In contrast to some of the more negative historians, a fawning account written by a poet who is not trying to get himself killed tells of these women in the arena taking position on either side, fighting like the Amazons. It's unclear though if these were attempting to act out stories of the Amazons, or if it was just a poetic device by this author. In heavy contrast to all this is the treatment of Titus, Domitian's older brother. Titus essentially gets a free pass from ancient historians in that he died only two years after he ascended to the throne. As a result, he's known for two main things while on the throne. His response to the eruption of Vesuvius and the inauguration of the Flavian Amphitheater, also known as the Roman Colosseum. Multiple sources attest to the fact that women participated in these inaugural events, though it's not explicitly clear if they performed as gladiatrices or just in the beast hunts. Martial references that the Emperor, not satisfied with Mars alone, also brought Venus in to delight the crowds. The theme of this spectacle was to stage a retelling of the myth, so there was one criminal woman who played the role of Pacify, raped to death by a bull. A man played Prometheus and was gored by animals while strapped to a cross. Heracles was also apparently gender-bent, and the unnamed gladiatrix won rapturous applause for killing the Nemean lion. Unlike the more corrupt emperors, Titus actually won commentary and some praise for this. He notably made sure to use only lower class women, which made it a little bit more palatable for later historians and the Roman upper classes. Regardless, gladiatrices continued to be a popular, if rare, attraction throughout the first century AD. They were seen as novelties throughout, and while sources are essentially non-existent, it can be generally assumed that a similar sentiment prevailed through the second century as well. One of the only surviving sources from this time period is the aforementioned inscription in Ostia by Hostilianus, claiming that he was the first person to ever bring warrior women into the arena. Additionally, there's a skeleton that was found outside London that may be the body of a female gladiator, as evidenced by the fact that she was buried with a number of honorific items, including a lamp that was emblazoned with a triumphal gladiatorial match. 
Her bones, though, are generally free of the damage that gladiators endured, so it's impossible to truly say what she was involved in. The assumed end of the era of the gladiatrixes came with Septimius Severus. Around the year 200, it seems he held a massive athletics competition with people from across the empire. Here, women were included, competing with each other in the same types of events as the men, but the Roman audience was filled with as many catcalls as cheers. Many of these catcalls were directed at aristocratic women, asking why they were so demure when the athletes were fiery and passionate. Details are frustratingly scarce about the event, but Cassius Dio tersely claims that, quote, Therefore, it was henceforth forbidden for any woman, no matter what her origin, to fight in single combat. From this point on, it seems that female gladiators were barred entirely. While it's possible that some instances may have occurred, especially after the death of Septimius Severus, there are no sources to support this, and therefore we must assume that this ban held from now on until the end of the Roman era. I hope you've appreciated our continued exploration of the world of Roman gladiators. What topics would you like to see us cover next? Be sure to head on over to our Patreon to participate in polls, catch script previews, and get HD downloads of all our art. I also wanted to note that we owe a huge debt of gratitude to our current patrons for funding the channel and to the researchers, writers, and artists for making this episode possible. We certainly couldn't have done it without them and this community. Be sure to like and subscribe for more content, and check out these other related episodes. See you in the next one.